So we're going to talk a little bit about game theory, but not the mathematical game theory, the transactional analysis game theory, um, which itself is part of social psychology. So real quick primer, transactional analysis is specifically looking at the individual parts of social communication as transactions that you have a stimulus and then a response, and then that response is then a stimulus to the other person who then gives another response, and you know, that's the flow of conversation. Transactional analysis looks at, essentially breaks down the transactions as there being two parts. Um, well, the stimulus, there being two parts, and then the, since the um, response is also a stimulus, that also has two parts as well, and um, you have the primary and an ulterior, and ulterior not as in it's some kind of manipulative thing, because that's usually how ulterior is used, but um, just that there's another component that's not immediately obvious at surface level, but it is still a part of the transaction. <laughs> One of my cats got the zoomies uh, running around the yard like a nut job. So, a game in this context doesn't necessarily refer to a manipulative thing. Well, I'll, I'll mention a very constructive game and how it's a game. But a game is a series of transactions, a stereotyped series of transactions. Um, because yes, human behavior is actually this predictable, as much as some people don't want to admit that. Um, where there is an ulterior. See, there's not always an ulterior in somebody's transactions. Uh, buying something from a store is a great example of where there isn't one. As long as there's not a salesman. If there's a salesman, there's a good chance there are ulteriors. That, again, aren't always negative, but some of them rely on some very negative shit to do their job. Um, you know, you bring your stuff up to the register and there'll be a few social stimulus strokes, as they're called. And, you know, uh, hey, did you find everything that you need? And so on. You have a very basic conversation that's literally about nothing and it, it, exchanging a few social strokes. A positive game, just to get out of the way that this is not necessarily a negative thing, is the mentor-mentee relationship. On the surface level, it looks very parent-parent, or sorry, very adult-adult, that you've got somebody wanting to learn and somebody wanting to teach, and that it is a mature relationship between the two. And it largely is considered that. But Think about it. In what other situation do you have somebody teaching somebody who wants to learn? The parent-child. Mentor-mentee relationships are considered a game because of that. And there are things that inevitably you can see people who are prone to being mentors do just because it's subtle little fishing or hooks uh, kind of snag a mentee. Not a bad thing. I don't think anybody would describe that as a bad thing. It's a very constructive relationship. It's a fantastic way to learn. But there is an ulterior, which makes it a game. There are some destructive games that I've been doing that are learned. You, you learn them. Uh, it's been shown that parents wind up passing a lot of them on to their kids at ridiculously young ages. Um, studies where they've gotten permission to record a mother engaging with their newborn you know, before one years old. They can find evidence of these games taking place. So if they don't let up... Um, you know, it is a fantastic way to learn 
positive ones, constructive ones, but it's also a... You can get some very destructive games impressioned on you. One of these games that I've learned to not play on my own is the alcoholic. Although my role in the alcoholic is not the alcoholic, it's more the savior. The idea with the alcoholic game is that it's not specifically about alcoholism. It's just that's how it was first described, because there's tons of examples of that. It was you know, much easier to study a case where it was a legal drug, especially since transactional analysis got its start. Uh, Mid-50s, I believe. Researching other drugs wasn't as... So, oh, this is definitely burnt out. Mm. You've probably encountered these types of situations where... Somebody is engaging in repeated destructive behavior and almost seems to be seeking out the punishment for it and will glorify the punishments of it. Talking about how much they had to drink, how bad the hangover was. Come home to the wife who... Not necessarily a sexual thing. I'm a man. I'm typically going to describe things from a male perspective. But come home to the wife who is initially supportive. Like, all right, let's get you cleaned up. Make sure you actually throw up in the toilet, not all over the floor, yada, yada. And then scold him in the morning. The man is super apologetic. And then the wife apologizes or forgives the, the husband. Because he made a convincing case of how he won't do it again, and then next week does the exact same thing, and it plays out the exact same way, again and again and again and again. In that case, the role of the, the savior is somebody who comes along and tries to help them get cleaned up. And for a while it seems like it's working, but it's never going to work. And I caught on to that about ten years ago. Stopped doing that. Watched some friends go into very bad drug spirals that they have never recovered out of. But just learned that you're not going to fix them because they don't actually want to be fixed yet. Unfortunately, Alcoholics Anonymous plays into this game at all a lot um, to where... AA is not actually a constructive form of treatment. Uh, don't put alcoholics into AA. It's not actually going to help. Um, because what winds up happening a lot of the time is the other alcoholics who have reco recovered um, wind up picking up the other roles of, say, savior or supplier or other roles, not necessarily the role of alcoholic because they're not the alcoholic anymore. And it goes fine and dandy and everybody thinks they're doing better and that recovery is happening up until they run out of people to play the role of alcoholic. And so somebody relapses so that the game can continue. Hence why. AA is not effective in there. There are plenty of studies to back that up, that it's not just a philosophical argument through a theoretical framework that there is evidence to support that AA is not effective. There are other games where it's much more... My role in them is much more destructive. And it's all just shit that I learned during childhood from either my parents or 
a psychologist I saw as a child that was really fucking bad that other, the, the psychologist that I'm seeing right now and one I saw before had, um, well, I'm seeing a psychiatrist now, but had, um, had some choice words about how they should have their license removed because of complete and utter incompetence and even a few things that were illegal. So there's been some shit that I have to unlearn from her and... other places as well. Um... Luckily, as you start to identify those and exactly what's going on, how to identify the game beforehand, because again, at the su su uh, the whole thing about a game is that there is an ulterior in the transaction, that it doesn't look like the game at surface level. You know, the, the way a um, savior looks to an, uh, in an, the alcoholic game looks productive, looks like they're doing a good thing, but it's never going to yield a good thing because that's not actually the point. As you understand those, as you can identify them, it becomes easier to not play into them. And sometimes you run into some situations where the need to play the game is very strong. In those cases, the person needs to go through transactional analysis therapy, and sometimes CBT is helpful as well. Uh, that's cognitive behavioral therapy. In my case, it seems like luckily, um, at least any games that we've identified that I've been playing a role in, I don't want to be, but I am just because that's what's been learned. So the, the convenient thing about that is just identifying them well enough is enough to get out of that spiral. One I will always wind up having trouble with, though, is when people invalidate other people's experiences. And with what I've said before, uh, that shouldn't be surprising at all. I did have a fantastic interaction earlier with uh, David Kay of Microsoft, if you've worked with XState, uh, that's part of React, I believe. Um, that David Kay, where I was just pointing out that trying to be as you know polite and whatnot as possible, that, you know, I... I get where you're coming from, but not everybody has had that same experience, and you're kind of missing part of the picture. Uh, it had started to devolve a little bit, but we had actually rectified that. And the fantastic thing, and how you can kind of see how I don't want to be playing these games, is... After he had owned up to misinterpreting me, which happens all the time, misinterpretations happen on all sides, Lord knows I've done it plenty of times as well, I didn't double down. It wasn't a, oh, you fucked up, and I'm going to make you realize how badly you fucked up, and I'm going to make you, you know, regret it. It was, you know, it happens. We've all done it. Well, proceeded to have a very polite, mature back and forth about, um, our perspectives, where I was coming from, that I actually largely agreed with his point, but just wanted to make sure that he was seeing the other side of it, and totally, totally okay uh, interaction. Totally what you want to see. Yeah, that's going to burn out again. I'm getting a little chilly. Camera's getting a little shaky because it's colder and you can see it's not a sunny day at all. So um, I'm going to finish up now. But If you've been having a lot of interactions that 
play out the same way over and over and over again, and you don't understand why, looking into transactional analysis and game theory specifically can be hugely beneficial and help you recognize why it's playing out the same way and what you can even do about it. So, have a good one, guys.